After this video lecture, students will be able to use de Broglie's equation to calculate wavelengths uh, associated with matter that has specific mass values. So while we were looking at the observations of Planck and Einstein, um, we were able to kind of be led to two main ideas or two main questions. And that is, is energy a wave, um, like light, or particle? Um, and the answer to that is yes. And I know that seems a little odd, but basically we know that matter behaves both as a wave and both as a particle. We call this uh, feature, this property, wave particle, the wave particle duality of matter. And that means that, you know, matter has both wave and uh, particle-like properties. And we see that from the calculations that we've been able to do um, and that uh, the interrelationship between, between Einstein's E equals mc squared equation um, as well as the E equals h nu equation um, that was uh, shared by Planck. So uh, basically uh, the relationships between these two are uh, reality that has been tested and um, been observed um, in different types of experimentation. So de Broglie's main question that he was attempting to answer um, in his um, observations and his research was if uh, matter uh, that is uh, clearly particulate um, having mass, etc., um, if that type of matter uh, exhibits wave-like properties. So from other experimentation, we've seen that um, items that have wave-like properties also have uh, particulate properties. We were able to show that, and de Broglie wanted to show that the reverse of that is as true as well. So uh, he came up with the equation that you hear, see here, what he's done here is he's manipulated one of the previous equations that we've seen, um, and instead of having um, your m equals uh, h over frequency times the speed of light, he substituted in v, and v in this case is not your frequency, um, this is velocity. So we're not referring to the frequency here, we're referring to the velocity. So he manipulated this um, equation that we've referred to before, um, and he substituted in velocity dv. Okay, and basically what this equation allows us to do is to calculate the wavelength of an object um, at a specific speed. Um, so uh, what's interesting about this is that um, when we do these calculations, they really only work for small objects. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that because um, the mass of an object can be so uh, large or so small, it being in the denominator is going to directly affect um, the wavelength uh, that is calculated. So h is Planck's constant, m is mass, v is velocity. So if I have a fairly large object, I'm going to have a fairly large overall denominator, which is going to make my wavelength extremely small. Um, and so if we're dealing with larger objects, we may get a wavelength that is not observable. Um, if we're dealing with smaller objects, uh, we can actually obtain a, a wavelength that is observable. So um, theoretically, he has been able to show that uh, objects uh, with a specific velocity and specific mass are um, capable of producing um, wavelengths, so they do behave as waves as well. Um, but it is most clear because with smaller objects because of this uh, denominator issue that was just discussed. So let's go ahead and let's actually try some uh, calculation um, to show how this works exactly. So they want us to compare the wavelength for an electron with a specific mass. Um, as you see here, traveling at a specific speed, specific velocity. Um, with that for a ball that has this mass traveling at this speed. Okay, so basically this is two calculations of wavelength. One for an object with relatively small mass and one with an object from with a relatively larger mass, comparatively speaking. And we're going to look at the wavelength values that we get for each of these. So we're going to be using this equation. Okay, and we're going to be doing this for two separate sets of data. So we're going to first start uh, with what we're given first, which is 
um, to figure out the wavelength of an electron. Okay, so the mass of that electron is equal to the following value. Okay, we also have our speed or, or our velocity of that electron. Okay, and we do have h, it's a constant. Planck's constant, we've seen this before. Um, we're going to check our units as we always do. Um, we have kilograms, we have meters, seconds, seconds. Okay, so we look like um, we're on the right track. Um, please remember that um, one joule is equal to kilogram meter squared per second squared. Okay, so we know that we're in this, the correct ballpark of units. So we can go ahead and plug everything in uh, to the equation on the left-hand side. So our wavelength is going to be equal to 6.6262 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times seconds divided by uh, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms times 1.0 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. Okay, if we plug this into our calculator, we end up with 7.27 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, and then our units, if we look at this here, if we plug in um, this value for our joules uh, and multiply that by seconds, we'll end up with kilograms meters squared per second. And if we check these units, seconds and seconds cancel, meters and one of the meters cancel, kilograms and kilograms will end up canceling. So we're left with meters as our units, which makes sense with respect to um, the wavelength that is seen here. So this is the wavelength associated with our object, our electron. Okay. Now if we do the same type of calculation for our ball, um, we know that our constant is going to be the same as Planck's constant. Um, I'm just going to put this into the units that would be anticipated if we plugged in our conversion here. Um, we're going to put our mass. And then we're going to put our velocity here. And if we go ahead and plug this into the equation, put this into our calculator, we end up with the following value. Um, if we check our units like we have, kilograms, kilograms cancel, meters is what's left over, and this is what we get with respect to the wavelength of the ball. Um, so if you look at these two values that we've calculated, notice the wavelength of the electron um, is much larger than the wavelength of the ball here. And so, you know, there's, there's an observable um, range that, that we have, um, but as we get into larger objects, the wavelengths get so small that they're, you know, difficult to observe with the instrumentation and equipment that we have now. However, theoretically, um, this ball, in fact, does have this specific wavelength. Um, so this ball with this specific mass and this specific velocity has a wavelength and is therefore both a particle and a wave. And the same is true for the electron. It behaves as both a particle and a wave. So de Broglie was able to utilize this equation to show that Objects have that have mass that are distinctly particulate um, have waves, and he's showing that um, this is true with an object such as an electron, which in previous examples um, has been shown to have wave-like properties as well. So um, this is how they came about the wave-particle duality of matter and solidifying it as the concept that we adhere to.